Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Vorträge, to be able to support the symposium. I think uh, it's a fantastic approach and it's a huge challenge we need to tackle. And therefore, uh, thank you for the symposium. Thank you for you being here. It's fantastic <laughs> for me. It's also like for you probably since two years, the first large Congress again live. So this is really good. I want to start with my conflict of interest, obviously. Uh, I listed here all companies I do um, give lectures. Uh, however, the topic we're discussing today, I think, is free of conflict, at least in my opinion. I want to start with European data. Uh, European Society of Anesthesiology just finished or ran this large project here in Europe with 177 centers, and that hopefully gives you a slight impression what our challenge is. Then in this project, we looked at elderly patients, elderly above 80 years. So I think we can agree that's really elderly patient. And uh, just to give you the impression, we did preoperative minicoc testing, for example, and only 25% had normal cognition preoperatively. Functional status. No? A lot of these patients, 40% have been not dependent living, limited mobility, for example, time up and go test. So that's the challenge you all know and we all see in everyday practice. And we, in everyday practice, we see the difference. You know, there are the fit elderly and perhaps impaired, frail patients. So we need to test, and this is a part of the minicoc test, for example, and uh, you probably would see on the right hand side this kind of answer or this kind of drawing, and that gives you an impression that this patient or this person might be uh, in cognitive uh, decline. This is Victor Cohn. Victor Cohn is an artist from New York, and he draws a lot of pictures, and one of them I want to show you. This is his impression of delirium, how he sees delirium. And I think a lot can be seen in there, a lot can be seen in the dizziness, the fogginess, uh, the association with animals, for example, and I think we can all agree that's not a positive picture, you know, it's kind of frightening, and that's, that's what we see, and that's what we see in ICUs, uh, hypoactive delirium, for example, huge incidence in ICU in the elderly patient, or if you look at specific operations like hip fracture surgery, we do have uh, quite a high number or incidence of delirium. What does that mean? What does that mean for the patient? And if we talk about delirium, we need to talk about cognitive function, cognitive decline. And there have been a lot of studies in the last years, and to summarize that, uh, there has been a, a meta-analysis, and yes, there's a clearly association, and that's, I think, not a surprise. Patients who had post-operative delirium were associated with a cognitive decline, for example, three months after the event, and uh, that's a strong association here. Furthermore, and I showed you the pictures, we need to see the patient, we need to see frailty, for example. Yeah? And uh, these are quite new data, also a meta-analysis again. And yeah, we know in the elderly patient uh, we have a number of frailty. Quite interesting, the number, also the, the incidence of frailty actually is quite low, and that depends on what kind of test you use. Uh, and that's not that easy, since there's a huge variety of tests and uh, you can have a patient with multimorbidity, yet the incidence of frailty, for example, also in post was only 14%. And we know the numbers for delirium, and this is the first time in a meta-analysis to, uh, to show the clear association with frailty and post-operative delirium. So one of the points I think is uh, this is quite important, and talking about this, uh, we need to assess and that's, for example, the picture I showed you, and um, that's a challenge we have. Then most of the frailty assessments are time-consuming, since they have a huge variety of dimensions they test. And yeah, I showed you, we know that the association with delirium, for example, mortality, and also complications with frailty. So what kind of test shall we use, or what's ideal? Um, and here, as I said, that's the challenge, the challenge uh, if what kind of time we need to assess that, the feasibility, and it seems like, at least in this meta-analysis, the clinical frail scale is at least a test which is easy to assess, uh, which is feasible, and I just 
uh, it works with pictograms, and in these pictograms you can associate the patient, and that gives you a chance at least to to see this patient, let's say, in one or two minutes. That's not a deep frailty assessment. However, it gives you a hint, and I think in the right direction. Talking about frailty, there are other risk factors, and um, we did a work together with Rob Sanders, and to to assess all kind of risk factors um, or all models uh, for delirium, and it's quite surprising. There are a lot of models. There are like 27 different uh, tests and uh, risk factor uh, studies. However, if you look at the quality, the area under the curve or the, the prediction score, most of them are below 0.75, which is actually not that good for a test, or you could say it's not good at all. So after all, this is the only one so far available which has an area under the curve nearly of one. And you see here the risk factors, age for example, um, the, the independency of the patient, um, hearing and sensory impairment, the emergency surgery, open surgery and IC, planned ICU admission gives you the risk points and if you score more than uh, equal more than seven points, you're at high risk for post-operative delirium. So such simple scores may help you to predict if to see if you have a patient at risk. We're still in the preoperative assessment and what do our European Society of Anesthesiology and ICU uh, pre uh, give us on hand? So do we have the recommendations for the geriatric um, patient? Uh, I'm quite happy I worked in this group to, uh, to establish these um, points. And that's an update, so we have far more points now. We have now 10 recommendations, and you can see the grade of recommendations is 1B. So there's a strong evidence. However, if you would ask me in my department, what can I do? Am I actually assessing um, malnutrition? Am I assessing um, the, uh, the depression score? No, I'm not doing it. since. So far, I have not a time for that. We have roughly 20 minutes, and so we need to see what can we implement in our clinical routine. In my opinion, that's the frailty is a very important uh, point, as I said, a clinical phrase scale, for example, or cognitive impairment as an addition, for example, with the minicoc. Each, both tests are in one or two minutes, so uh, you can try to implement them in your clinical practice. Another aspect uh, to optimize our patients, prehabilitation. I think the concept is clear. Yeah? Uh, you would train if you would run a marathon. They're hard. I know one guy who runs a marathon without training, but I think that's not really wise. Uh, but in general, you would really train to do that. And we have some factors we can modify. Unfortunately, the evidence and, uh, so far is not that convincing. But I strongly believe in it, and I think we in the future we'll see a lot of, lot of trials uh, focusing on this point. So, if we're looking at delirium, and uh, again, the ESA guidelines, um, in the preoperative setting, there's one recommendation I want to focus on, that's pre-medication. Yeah, and there's a uh, statement uh, we suggest avoiding routine pre-medications in the elderly, um, except for severe anxiety. However, and that's one of the topics I want to discuss with you, if you look at the evidence incorporated in this recommendation it's actually quite weak it's very weak indeed since the studies are not actually focusing on premedication and delirium and um, so recent very recent uh, studies uh, are looking at this um, challenge and here for example uh, there's a propensity score matching uh, analysis midazolam versus non and the primary outcome parameter was delirium postoperative delirium and after all, you can see it's the elderly patient at risk. However, if you look at the dosing, first of all, it was a low dosing, it's a roughly two milligrams, so that's IV. In Germany, for example, we give a lot of premedication, oral premedication. I think that's not wise since uh, it's just the routine of uh, route of application is a challenge itself. However, the primary outcome permitted, that was postoperative delirium the first day, there was absolute no difference. And there are two more studies which are actually going in the same direction. I don't show them, just a limited time. And we're running one of the largest so far in the elderly patient, randomizing midazolam versus placebo. And secondary outcome is postoperative delirium. In my opinion, I think a single dose preoperative won't have that much effect on the outcome as we so far thought it would have. So let's go into the R. ER. 
do we have a magic bullet? Is there a magic you know, uh, treatment to prevent post-operative delirium? So what are our options? Ketamine, for example, yeah? NNDA receptor antagonist, is that protective? Or at least from the hypothesis it could be. So there was a large randomized controlled trial, primary outcome per meter, post-operative delirium, a single dose of uh, different, also 0.5 or 1 milligram versus placebo before incision, and um, no, there was absolutely no difference in post-operative delirium for a higher risk population. A second approach was, uh, I th look, it's a colibri, of course, it's xenon, but from the theoretical point, again, an NMDA receptor antagonist, a large randomized controlled trial, um, and yes, primary outcome parameter was post-operative delirium. And if I look into your faces, I think, hmm, yeah, that's true. Unfortunately, again, no difference. Yeah? So uh, from the background, you would think, yeah, perhaps it's protective. But no, in the clinical routine, in a clinical setting, we couldn't see the effect we thought we would see. So are there other uh, possibilities? Yeah, Dexmedetomidine, for example. Yeah? Uh, we have seen in the past some studies, you know, kind of very interesting, and therefore we did this uh, meta-analysis. We summed up all the data so far, uh, but that's 2018, and yeah, we could see, it seems like there's a good evidence, and for specific settings, cardiac surgery, for example, or elderly patient, it seems to be protective. However, if you look at the recent studies after uh, the point of uh, we've done this meta-analysis, there's, for example, this decade trial. It was a large um, trial in the cardiac surgery setting, um, intraoperative and postoperative dexmedetomidine on a low dose, 24 hours after surgery. Primary outcome parameter was a combination of uh, cardiac events and postoperative delirium. And if you look at the data, there was no difference, and the study needed, to, as it was prematurely stopped since of the interim analysis, and uh, we saw more prolonged ICU stay with the DEX group, uh, increased hypotensions. So after all, the data are not that convincing. So we had now different aspects, different possible magic bullets, but no, they're not that convincing so far. But our daily business is general anesthesia or regional anesthesia, yeah? so that's what we do every day. However, the evidence, again, for outcome is not, again, quite challenging, unfortunately. Mark, for example, I really must congratulate him on that, managed to do this study, 1,600 patients, randomization in hip fracture, spinal versus general anesthesia. I just wanted to show you some numbers on that. That's really a challenge. And these patients are above 80 years old, and to just randomize this, this is quite difficult, and you can see a liable 22,000 patients randomized 1,600. Two groups, spinal versus general, and in the spinal group, you see the crossover, yeah, 666 patients, or more than 100 patients needed to switch from spinal to general anesthesia. So that's, that's a challenge in itself. Yet, they managed this trial, and it's the largest so far in this setting. It's the largest randomized trial general versus spinal anesthesia itself. And primary outcome parameter was 60-day mortality and ability to cross a room, to walk across a room. There was no difference. And then one of the secondary outcome parameters was delirium, post-operative delirium. And you so see in the lowest line, again, it's quite, there's no difference. So unfortunately, you know, we do a lot of work and we're getting better and better, yet the evidence is not that convincing so far. And if you look at the outcomes, hospital outcome, for example, again, no difference between the groups. Nearly in the same time, a couple of weeks later, a uh, Chinese um, study, um, again, RAGA trial, regional versus um, general anesthesia, in the elderly hip fracture patients, same setting, uh, same randomization or similar randomization. Uh, quite interesting from my point of view um, is, well, I'll show you this here now, um, 2,000 patients are liable, and they managed to include nearly all patients. So it's really a different approach. It seems like it's a different approach uh, in China than we have it here, for example, in the United States and Canada, or in Germany, we're running a similar trial. And there's no crossover, so 476 uh, 76 patients in a spinal group, and only uh, five crossed. Yeah? So uh, there's a much more strict approach in, uh, in this setting. However, if we look at the outcome, and here, 
post-operative delirium was actually the primary outcome parameter, and you can see two things. First of all, you can see there's no difference. And secondly, the incidence of post-operative delirium is surprisingly low. And the authors argue in this direction that in China, the family, the whole family is in hospital or takes care of the patient, and therefore they think the incidence was that low, as we can see here. But yet again, in our daily business, general spinal anesthesia, anesthesia, no difference. I will just talk, scratch this topic, then you will talk on that in detail. Um, engaged trial, for example, do we need death of um, uh, anesthesia monitoring? I totally uh, think uh, that's a very important um, surrogate parameter. However, if we're looking in the primary outcome parameter here, delirium, uh, major surgery as a bis blinded versus not blinded, um, the data again is not that, uh, not that clear. And for the primary outcome parameter, the delirium, there was no difference in the groups. Only for the birth suppression duration, there was a cl clear benefit for the EEG-guided group. However, if you look at the functional outcome, the delirium, there was no difference. And this is just a couple of days old, um, this um, review and meta-analysis from Liz Everett, uh, Everett and her group. And they summarized all the data so far and also the one I just showed you. And to see if there's, uh, how, how is the evidence? And they made two groups, and it's a processed EEG group and or lighter uh, targeted group in anesthesia versus standard care or uh, deep uh, EEG target group. And uh, they, they brought together all the studies and it's just on the border. So statistically seen, there's no difference. But however, what I could show is that the trials are really challenging themselves. You know, there's a huge heterogeneity in these groups. And if you do sub-analysis and just, if you really go strict protocol and as the manufacturer suggests how to do it, then there was a benefit for the EEG-guided group for the prevention of post-operative delirium. So where do we stand? What can we do? And I think it's an approach we need to do in a perioperative setting. And the approach is to work together as a team. And this is now the recommendation that we worked on for frailty fracture network on hip fracture, but that also accounts for delirium. Yeah? We have to have multidisciplinary pathways. We need experienced surgeons, but also anesthetists. We ad need to adapt, no matter what we do, if it's general anesthesia or spinal anesthesia, we need to adapt our approach, our dosaging, for the goals of the patient. Yeah? It's early mobilization, for example, for the hip fracture patient. And we have to talk about it. We have to have training, conferences, talks like we have them here now. So the perioperative multidisciplinary pathway is a crucial step to prevent post-operative delirium. And to summarize and to see what the guidelines, the European guidelines, yeah, and we have fast track surgery concepts. Monitoring death of anesthesia is a level A recommendation. The evidence, in my opinion, is a bit lower, yet I think it's an important aspect. And uh, adequate uh, pain assessment treatment um, uh, to reduce post-operative delirium. And if we see the setting, the perioperative setting, also in the uh, normal wards or ICU, it's certainly the non-pharmacological measures, fast-track surgery concepts, uh, and especially important, not just the preoperative assessment, but also the post-operative assessment. We're doing that on the ICU on a really good level. However, what are we doing in the post-anesthetic care unit? What are we doing on the normal care unit? Do we actually assess these patients? To sum up, to summarize, in my opinion, the perioperative management to prevent postoperative delirium is really only feasible in a team, in a multi-professional way with uh, pathways. We have to keep our patient uh, targeted on the maintenance of homeostasis, no matter what kind of anesthesia we're doing. In the preoperative phase, it's a risk assessment. Uh, obviously, um, I showed you the data on the benzodiazepine, but very simple things, you know, to minimize fasting time, for example, uh, minimize the time without sensory uh, aids. These are so simple aspects, and you really can help the patients a lot. In the intraoperative setting, it's not that easy. I think the patient, and as I said, you know, the outcome of the patient, no matter what you're doing, has to be on your focus. The data, if it's general or regional anesthesia, 
the death of anesthesia monitoring are not that convincing so far, and we just have to think ourselves the best way to treat our patient in our setting. And in the post-operative phase, obviously, it's the assessment again on your ward, on the PACU or on the ICU, uh, concepts for pain management, concepts for early mobilization, and all that together in such a concept, I think, in my opinion, is the best way to prevent perioperative delirium. Thank you very much for your attention.